Thanks, Brooke. Um, you know, I, I think you've got a very challenging task um, as an audience trying to figure out how to put all this together. Um, and, and that speaks to the, the immensity of the subject of humans and nature and, uh, and its effects on he healing it's, uh, or its effects on us, you know, more broadly construed. And you, you've uh, been treated to um, a remarkable diversity and, and variety of, of perspectives and disciplines today, which, you know, speaks to this, um, this uh, incredible variability. Because really, when you're talking about humans and nature, you're talking fundamentally about what makes us human. Uh, we are nature. We are biological. And so trying to put all the, this together um, is, is quite a task. I don't envy uh, Kurt Miney, who's supposed to wrap it all up um, later today. Uh, and, how, and, and the challenge is how to, how to uh, cohere and integrate you know, the various things that you've heard. And, and maybe that's not necessary. Uh, most of it will be, you know, we're all uh, blind men and women with the elephant touching a piece of it and trying to understand the whole. And, um, and maybe we shouldn't be so presumptuous to, to think that we know the whole. I, I'm going to try to offer you some perspective on this human nature relationship that speaks to this question of birthright because it talks about, I'll talk about our inherent uh, need to affiliate with nature, and uh, which is our birthright. But like so much of what makes us human, it's a birthright that must be earned to become fully functional and um, and, uh, and and beneficial for us. Um, so um, so that, that was just a, a bit of a qualification, and you know, speaking to this this remarkable variety that I'll just add to in, in many respects. Uh, although I have another qualification, is we had this great session which you heard about. Uh, yesterday, where a small subset of mainly the speakers got together for this intimate um, exchange of uh, of our different backgrounds and views, and and built a relationship that was quite experiential as well as intellectual, and uh, and it was so rich and vibrant that not, some of us didn't want to stop, so we didn't. We got a bottle of scotch and we went on, <laughs> much to my stupidity today. But uh, anyway. Um, let me, I'm going to, this is going to be a whirlwind, uh, I, uh, I warn you. Um, and, and because I'm going to try to cover so much ground, I, I thought it might be helpful to get a, a sense for uh, the whole. I'm going to speak uh, at the outset about this notion that we have an inborn need to affiliate with nature, and it's essential to our physical and mental health and well-being. And just to give it a fancy term, we. Uh, we call it biophilia, uh, which I'll explain in a little bit. And then it's a, it's a simple concept, as you'll hear, but how it reveals itself in our lives is highly complex, and, it, and not the least of which is different ways we attach meaning and derive benefit from uh, the, uh, the world beyond ourselves, which we call nature, um, and uh, in these diverse values, in addition to the fact that Again, like I said, it's a birthright that must be earned. It's a weak biological tendency uh, that uh, is highly uh, dependent on learning and experience and other factors to become functional and, and adaptive. Um, and that's, uh, that's problematic. That, that has, has to be achieved, earned, as I suggested. And, um, and there are many ways in which that um, uh, can occur and cannot occur. Um, and, uh, but I'll, I'll provide a little bit of the evidence um, empirical evidence to support the notion that this is instrumental in, in who we are in our, in our health and well-being. Uh, the problem what we face today is an impoverished sort of biophilic environment, if you will, uh, due to uh, many ways in which we've compromised our, our capacity to derive um, benefit from the natural world, everything from the obvious symptoms of environmental damage to increasing separation and, and in some cases alienation from nature that you heard about about from various speakers um, that reflects some of our basic premises as a, as a culture and society, uh, and, a, and, uh, and a growing disconnection from place, which is important uh, because we are a deeply territorial creature, and, um, and, um, and especially prominent 
as a factor in the, these uh, challenges that we need to reconcile is the built environment um, and, and especially the prevailing paradigm and design of the built environment, and I'll come back to that in a, uh, in a little while, and the suggestion by implication that we need a new paradigm of development uh, of the built environment, which has become the main place where we, where we live and reside. Um, and, uh, and we've done a little bit of that with trying to minimize our ad adverse effects on the natural environment. That's our impact on the environment. But the converse of that is how the environment impacts us, which we haven't done very much of. And um, what we call that, I'm calling that biophilic design. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. So anyway, this is the, um, what I'm going to try to cover uh, very rapidly. So this, this term biophilia is, has been uh, used by my colleagues uh, and myself to just describe this notion that we have a, an inherent need to, uh, to affiliate. And I w we use the word affiliate because it's much broader than the literal Latin translation of biophilia, which means love of life. Affiliate, as we'll talk about in a moment, I'll talk about in a moment, it covers a, a wide variety of ways in which we are inclined to connect with the natural world. Love and affa affection is one, but there are many others, including aversion and, and uh, and, uh, and control and other aspects. But the point is that these uh, tendencies to affiliate with nature are instrumental in our physical and mental health and productivity and well-being. Now, the, the uh, evolutionary logic of biophilia is, is um, what you have there is the evolution and devolution of, of man, if you will. But, um, you know, we went from, we merged bipedal and now we're returning to our previous stature. But anyway, um, uh, human history, you know, 90, over 99% of our history, it, it, was in a, it was in a natural, not a constructed or created or artificial context. The things that we think of as deeply human that's so characteristic of our lives today, whether it be large-scale agriculture or, or the urban uh, phenomenon or industrial production, electronics, and so forth, are, are really a, practically a blink of the eye in uh, in the history of our species. And, and consequently, our, our mind and body evolved in a natural, as I said, suggested, not artificial or engineered world. And that's another way of saying it, is that our mind and our senses, and the mind is so much of what makes us human, uh, evolved in a biocentric, not a human-created or, or anthropocentric or artificial world. Um, if biophilia is an evolutionary adaptation in humans, we should at least find it in other uh, primates. Um, and while there has been very little work on that, uh, some work by Ver Verbeek and DeWall looked at the biophilic tendencies and adaptive benefits in, in certain non-human primates and found a range of ways in which nature is used, not just for the obvious, you know, uh, food and shelter, but exploration, exploitation, social learning, attachment, uh, identity, investigation, discovery, emotional mediation, uh, pleasure and wonder. Uh, these sound a lot like uh, ourselves, and, and in many respects they are. So there is some limited evidence to suggest that uh, biophilia is uh, more universal than we think. Now, as I said, biophilia is a simple concept, and its evolutionary logic is, is simple, but its expression in, in among us is complex, like so much of, of, of our species. And, and not the least of which that it occurs in, in uh, different ways in which I suggest that these values, attaching meaning, deriving benefit from nature, uh, everything from affection and attraction and aversion and dominion, material exploitation, intellectual development, spirituality, or another way of, say, finding purpose and meaning in life, and symbolic representation, which may sound odd, but we are, above all else, the symbolic animal that's a, it's the root of our ability to form language, to create culture, to uh, convey knowledge from generation to generation. Um, and nature is not only a literal experience, but every time we have an, express, an experience with actual nature, we almost simultaneously um, uh, represent that in a symbolic or metaphorical way, which becomes, in very subtle ways, the root of our, of our capacity for communication and development. So let me just give an illustration in the aesthetic value of nature, since we are in a place that is so aesthetically powerful. And, uh, and a couple of 
people I admire greatly, uh, Edward O. Wilson and Aldo Leopold, hint, hinted at the importance of uh, aesthetics. Uh, Wilson said, beauty is our word for the perfection of those qualities of environment that have contributed the most to our survival. Leopold said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Are, are these just rhetorical, or are there something deeper in, the, in, in, the, in terms of the meaning of what these two great thinkers, I think, is something very deeply important. And yet, we tend to marginalize and trivialize the importance of aesthetics. Uh, we've elevated certain values to a very high plane in our society, such as material exploitation, and marginalized others like aesthetics, uh, which we think, oh, that's nice, it's pretty, but don't confuse it with what's important. And, um, and it's fine for those who can afford it, such as Norman Myers, who's a great conservation biologist, a man I greatly admire, but who remarks aesthetic judgment in nature is a prerogative of affluent people with leisure to think about such questions. Again, it's not in don't confuse it with it's important. It's one of those amenities, uh, luxuries, when you can afford it. But is there something more in the whole argument of biophilia that, are, that we find this uh, uh, inclination to be attracted to nature among all peoples and all historical periods, uh, among all socioeconomic groups? It's deeply embedded in our biology. And why would that be so? Um, so I'm not going to, I'm just using this as an illustration. Each of these values uh, can be. Uh, delineate in terms of their adaptive um, virtues. But these are just some of the ways in which our fitness is enhanced by our attraction uh, to the natural world. And uh, in terms of our intellectual development, our capacity to understand and discern an ideal, which we translate into our lives in all sorts of beneficial ways, uh, organizing the complexity uh, that surrounds us at all times and this uh, can be overwhelming. Uh, uh, nurturing our ability to sustain ourselves and secure uh, safety and caring and nurturing. So let, let me just briefly talk about a few of these. Intellectual development. I mean, aesthetics at its simplest is being attracted to something. That's what aesthetics is. You're attracted. Well, in the act of attraction, your curiosity is aroused. Now, often it doesn't go much beyond that, but uh, many times it does. Uh, we, through curiosity, we look more carefully. We look deeper. We explore. Uh, our imagination is, is, uh, is stimulated. And with that, the capacity for creativity and discovery are facilitated. All these are deeply uh, rooted in our intellectual and cognitive capacity and development. Striving after an ideal, the notion of proportion, of symmetry, of balance, of harmony, which is so much at the root of, of understanding, of invention, of discovery, of application. Um, the recognition of that ideal in the realization of the beauty of other things, the best of a kind to, to which all creatures strive. All creatures have their ideal and perhaps more nature more generally strives, even if it's rarely achieved. As Wilson suggests, the ideal to which human beings unconsciously pursue or strive no less relentlessly than any other creature, whether it's flycatchers or deer, deer mice. And in doing so, it becomes a model for emulation and design that can, that can be captured through simulation and mimicry. Uh, I would argue that biomimicry and many other inventive um, uh, tasks and ability to create uh, balance and, and coherence in, in so many aspects of our life is deeply uh, rooted in our uh, awareness of the ideal in the natural world that we incorporate and are inspired by in our own world. Organizing complexity, I and mean, the world out there is very, very complex. Um, certainly when we were, didn't have a, a, a controlled and constructed world, it was especially uh, uh, complex, and we needed to navigate and m make that world note coherent and legible in order for us to survive. But even in the current uh, context, uh, organizing complexity in both natural and human, made, uh, human created settings are are, are uh, facilitated by the actual or, or, or simulated um, presentation of nature that are used to achieve this end, whether it be a, an environment which becomes meaningful and coherent and legible because all of a sudden there's a red bird there, or a market scene which uses all kinds of aspects of nature, or a facade on a building or a, a park in a uh, city. 
And organizing complexity provides us the ability to access the richness of the information that we need to, uh, to be successful in so many ways, but in a way that is meaningful without it being excessively detailed or its opposite, monotonous. If it's too complex, we're, we're overwhelmed by the chaos and confusion of it. If it's too organized, we're bored as can be. Uh, it's, it's, it's homogenous, it's the same. And so organized complexity is an essential part of the aesthetic um, response. Illustrative of this aesthetic appeal of organized complexity in both natural and human made objects is something that's uh, called fractal geometry, which is a fancy way of saying that fractals are parts derived from holes, variations at different scales. And you'll find either, whether it's a leaf or, or a stained glass window or the facade of a building that the, some of our most attractive um, uh, situations um, or objects are, are where you see this variability, this, this diversity which stimulates us, uh, but it's organized as parts in, in relationship to the holes that organizes that complexity. Um, sustenance and security, um, food, water, refuge, wayfinding, nurturance and care, these are all aspects of sustenance and security that are facilitated uh, historically for sure, but even in the current context uh, by uh, the aesthetic uh, response to the natural world. Color is a, is a, is a dramatic e example of that, which for humans has been evolutionarily important in, in visually locating things like food and water and refuge or finding our way and moving across uh, landscapes. And it still continues to be uh, extraordinarily important, either directly or in metaphorical ways. Um, and it sometimes is quite um, subtle in its appearance. Uh, you know, human children are born helpless and remain dependent um, far longer than any other uh, creature, twice as long as our closest uh, uh, relative among primates. And, um, and so nurturance and care of the young is such a fundamental part of humanity. And there are these childlike characteristics that we find aesthetically pleasing that trigger this inclination to care. And there are things like a large head relative to body size or a curved forehead or large round eyes, uh, short relatively small nose and chin. And but the interesting thing is you can also find these in certain creatures that we consistently find aesthetically pleasing um, and we use in various ways as a consequence of that, whether it be pandas, raccoons, or even imaginary creatures. Mickey Mouse starts out like a rodent and he ends up uh, and over time with these characteristics that are called neotenous characteristics that, that trigger in a, a more aesthetic response. Mickey Mouse is much more aesthetically appealing than he started out. And uh, fortunately for Disney, and uh, so um, so all these biophilic values. This is just a brief, brief illustration. Uh, can confer potentially confer uh, diverse uh, benefits that advance our fitness as individuals and as, as societies. And each one is how that is so um, is something that I try to address in this book, Birthright, um, and. Um, uh, sort of my advertisement here, which I'll move on. Um, you know, the, the big question that, you know, I mean, and I think it was Keith or somebody who referred to the, the true believers uh, in the audience. We're all true believers, but m many of our society, much of our society might nod their head uh, um, in agreement, but remain deeply skeptical. And because our, our, our assumptions uh, have become so much that nature really isn't important. And in fact, the measure of progress in civilization, measured in, in the, the great triumphs of our, our civilization, agriculture and large-scale manufacturing and large-scale modern medicine, uh, urbanization, are built on the presumption that their advancement reflects our ability to at the least subdue and control and transform nature, and at the, at the most, in the dream of transcending nature and becoming something altogether different, more godlike and less biological, not like at all like any other animal, maybe not an animal at all. And so the view is that our advancement, it requires indoor abstract formal learning, uh, the mastering transformation and transcendence of nature, that nature is fine as an amenity and a rec recreational pastime or as a source of raw materials that we then render uh, productive through our, our, our technology, but that's about it. Uh, not certainly in building our 
physical and emotional, intellectual, moral, and spiritual capacity. Um, and, um, and those who, who advocate, who argue for the role of nature in modern life are, are largely romantics uh, who you know, pine for an obsolete and bygone era uh, and often um, uh, romantics who have the luxury to afford uh, that uh, ability. Um, the counter argument, which I've been making and will make more, is that our need for nature is deeply rooted in our biology. And, uh, and n lest it be thought of as vestigial, that is, involved in a, in a context that's no longer relevant to the modern world, it continues to be um, uh, uh, vital to our health and well-being. And, uh, and that if we repress or deny or den denigrate um, that role, of the non-human world and our development and well-being, we will impoverish our humanity, our body, mind, and soul, and, uh, and do, in doing so, uh, cause violence to ourselves. Uh, okay, so is there evidence uh, that contact with nature com continues to confer fitness in the modern world? Well, you, you've heard a lot of things today, um, and I'm gonna go through this very quickly because most of it you've heard, but there is some evidence uh, reduction in stress, improved health and healing, increased cognitive functioning, uh, attention and concentration, problem solving and critical thinking, uh, development of mastery skills, uh, which I think you heard, you got a little bit of a sense for that from Laura today, and those extraordinary articulations of the, of those uh, uh, young people in, uh, in, in wildland settings who are developing their sense of self-esteem and ability to control and master uh, uh, their life. Improved imagination, creativity, personality development in its, in, its, uh, in its most basic. But having said that, the evidence is very limited and quite fragmentary. You know, things like contact with nature increases recovery from illness and, and surgery, which we heard about and I'll talk a little bit about. That workers in office settings that have uh, natural lighting and ventilation, and that is the lowest hanging fruit of experience of nature, but still is something that's as, as uh, limited as that actually results in people performing better and having lower stress and greater motivation. Uh, and, and I'm gonna skip these because I'll, I'll just share some of the results and I have too many slides. So this is the one you heard before, the, you know, uh, Roger Ulrich's uh, classic gallbladder study, uh, which was where the patients were matched demographically and signed randomly to rooms. Uh, and the, you know, one looked at a non-spectacular uh, nature if, and the other looked at, at uh, a brick wall, which is not bad. It's natural material. It's got fractal geometry. Um, <laughs> but still, the patients with a nature window view had shorter post-surgical uh, stays, uh, fewer uh, post-surgical complications, uh, less need for potent um, painkillers, far fewer negative comments and nurses' notes, which is important because that's part of the ability of the caretakers to do their job well. And um, so, anyway, that's just this is the tip of the iceberg. And I think we, you heard this today as well. You know, hundreds of clinical reports showing uh, contact with companion animals can enhance healing and well being. Uh, things from chronic brain syndrome to uh, persons facing surger surgery and recovering from illness. A classic study by Ketcher and his colleagues of patients recovering from heart surgery. Again, match symptoms and demographics, one receiving conventional treatment, the other exposed to companion animals and mortality rates actually being affected um, by that in a fairly substantial way. Workplace studies, um, you, know, some, you know, sometimes after I give this, you know, some aspects of this talk, people say, well, this is all common sense. And yet the reality is that we don't seem to be practicing common sense. Uh, the average office worker in the United States works in a windowless environment. And we find that if just having a window view, again, a very limited experience of nature, results in less frustration, greater satisfaction, better health than workers without uh, window views or natural lighting. Uh, and even just a bringing plants in uh, will lower blood pressure, increase attention, and, and uh, in improve efficiency. Um, Factory studies, this one was actually done close to here in Michigan in a Herman Miller uh, factory, um, new facility, both office and manufacturing. And uh, after the plant renovation, uh, which included a number of what I call biophilic features, at nine months after, 
it was very sophisticated studies because they did it before or after, nine months after, 22% increase in worker productivity, uh, significant gains in motivation of workers and emotional satisfaction, less absenteeism. These are bottom line considerations. And a 20% increase in sense of well-being. You know, these terms we use, well-being and quality of life, which, you know, are kind of obscure the specifics of what it means to, ha to feel better and be more motivated and have less stress. Uh, community studies, uh, we did a large-scale uh, watershed study in the New Haven area, and, and we found a strong correlation, correlation of environmental quality and these values of nature and uh, human quality of life in 18 communities in this sub, uh, uh, sub-watershed communities, uh, which I won't get into what that means. And, uh, but, but importantly, we found the association occurred in both urban and non-urban and, and among all socioeconomic groups, which is something that uh, you heard about earlier from Bill Sullivan, which in his uh, very important and uh, seminal uh, work, uh, which I'll just uh, again sub summarize here, you know, that again, it's not just for those who can afford it or have the luxury or the opportunity, uh, even in a, you know, very poor uh, public housing area of uh, largely African-American, um, uh, residents uh, and nature being, this is limited nature, this is a few trees and a monoculture of grass, and after controlling for so many confounding factors, finding significant differences in drug and crime rates and cognitive function and coping with stress, social ties, optimism, attachment to place. Um, very important study, again, showing that this is, um, as I think Keith said before, you know, Keith underscored the process it needed to be bottom up, and, and, the, and the people needed to take ownership. But once they did, they arrived at the same place uh, as what we were advocating. And that was, that was a very important uh, point. And that wasn't about the effect. It was about the process to achieve the effect. Um, outdoor recreation studies, there's so many of them uh, that have uh, Alan Ewart uh, in the Forest Service summarized uh, hundreds of studies. And, and this is a chart from his summary of the psychological and sociological and physical benefits of the experience of nature in a direct kind of way. And I won't, in the interest of time, I won't go through these, but you get the sense. And increasing data coming in on children's health, uh, greater contact with nature found, uh, being found to reduce symptoms of uh, attention deficit disorder, anxiety, and stress. And the converse of that, that less contact with nature is is at least correlated uh, very strongly with increases in childhood obesity and adult diabetes in children and myopia. A lot of this summarized in uh, the annotated bibliographies of the Children Nature Network, which um, is a great resource. And then finally, personality development, where we're getting down to the roots of who we are. Uh, Harold Searles, who did a seminal uh, investigation many years ago that very few in his field followed up on on the role of nature and personality development. And he, he looked at these attributes of, of, you know, our basic personality, our realization of who we are through, in terms of our identity, our recognition of our abilities and limitations, our sense of reality, our self-concept and the view of the world as real, assuaging pain and anxiety, which is part of the human condition. We walk around with a lot of pain and anxiety. And how do we mitigate those feelings of aloneness and separation, which is so much at the root of anxiety and pain, and very often it's through our connection to the world beyond ourselves. And appreciating and accepting life, recognizing its value in both ourselves as a species and others. Um, and he concluded as a consequence that the non-human environment, far from being of little or no account to personality development, constitutes one of the most basically important ingredients of human existence, lest you think that this is well accepted. He did this 50 years ago, approximately. I bought a encyclopedia of childhood development about five years ago, just in case a developmental psychologist challenged me, Did you, have you ever read anything in, in developmental psychology? I had this. And there wasn't one chapter, let alone one index citation on nature and its role in personality development. Um, so the argument here is that biophilia is, continues to be critical to human fitness, uh, that it's not an amenity, it's not a luxury, it's the anvil as it always has been, on which our health and our fitness and our development continues to be forged. 
So as I said before, like much of human biology that makes us such a complex and, 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 uh, and uncertain uh, creature is that it's a, a weak tendency. It needs uh, to be developed. It needs to be earned through experience and learning and social support and uh, place-based uh, uh, connection. Um, and uh, without that, it isn't nurtured and developed. Uh, and, but I, it atrophies. But the opposite can occur. Any one of these values can be over-exaggerated and be dysfunctional as a consequence. So that makes it even more complicated. But nonetheless, it, it needs to be nurtured and developed. And, uh, you know, and that last one is, the others are, I think are pretty obvious, that place-based experience, I'll just s briefly say that that is an important part of who we are. In, in the course of our evolution, uh, our, the ability to control and understand your territory was very important to a social species such as our own. It allowed us access and control over resources, ways to find safety and refuge, to find ourselves, uh, uh, you know, find ways across uh, uh, landscapes, to discover and explore and uh, discover, to organize complexities, as I said before. And uh, Rene DeVos put it more poetically, he said, we needed to, uh, from a sensory, emotional, and spiritual dimension, um, experience an intimate interplay with a, an identification with the places in which we live. And this is especially important for children. You can't just drop children in nature. They have to have a sense of security and familiarity with the uh, places in which you do that. And one of the challenges in the neighborhoods that we heard about just now. Um, and the environment acquires these attributes of a place, the spirit of place, uh, through, the, through the fusion of culture and nature. Anyway, where both are changed in the process, but where both are changed in an adaptive way. Nature is changed and transformed, but it can be done in such a way that it's a more productive environment as a consequence that even though it's fundamentally transformed, and, and conversely, our culture is transformed by that interaction, but in ways that create landscapes that we deeply revere. So the, the, the rub, the challenge, of course, is that our modern life um, has in, you know, created increasing obstacles to this uh, development of uh, uh, nurturing development of our biophilic tendencies um, and experience of nature. You know, we spend 90% of our time indoors. That doesn't mean it, it can occur indoors, but it's far more challenging. Uh, the dominant paradigm of design and development of this indoor built environment um, is one that has been uh, fostered environmental degradation and separation from nature and, a, and, a, and a, a disconnect from the ecology and culture of place. And you see this especially nowadays among children. Uh, the average child today spends less than 40 minutes outside and just 20 years ago it was more than four hours. Um, on, on the other hand, the average child in an average week now spends 52 hours uh, engaged with electronic media of one sort or another. And just five years ago, it was 46 hours. They didn't think it could possibly go up, and it went up to 52 hours. And 31% uh, of children today regularly play outdoors in contrast to more than 70% of, the, of their mothers when they were children. And the typical eight-year-old's home range where they're engaged in free play, which is an important part of that developmental uh, impact of uh, nature, um, outside their home on their own has declined by 90% in the past two generations. And uh, Richard Louv called it nature deficit disorder, which was a good term. It really captured people's attention. And, um, and you know, to underscore this profound experiment that we're performing on ourselves. Um, and uh, Robert Pyle called it the extinction of experience. Both of these are exaggerations. There is no clinical disorder, nature deficit disorder. There, we're not going to extinguish experience, but we're extinguishing a kind of experience, and we're creating a dysfunction especially among children and their ability to access nature as part of their healthy uh, development. Um, and a growing placelessness. Uh, you know, as Edward Ralph, a geographer, said, if places are fundamental to our existence and to our security and identity, then it's important we don't lose it. And as he suggested, there are signs that the very means of it are disappearing in that placelessness, as he called it, uh, the weakening of these distinct and diverse experiences and identities of place has become a dominant force, uh, a process of increasing uh, what he called deep disassociation with places or, or rootlessness. 
So, um, and, and again, the particular challenge of the modern built environment in contributing to this, as I said before, the prevailing paradigm of design and development of the built environment, uh, which has become our natural habitat, um, has encouraged environmental degradation and separation from nature and spreading placelessness. And, uh, and four out of every five of us now live in an urban area. I, this is not a criticism of urban areas. That's where we want to be. And, uh, but historically, urbanization has meant uh, large-scale transformation and degradation of, uh, of natural systems and creating human habitats. So we may have evolved in the natural world, but the reality of the, our modern world, of course, is that the natural habitat of modern people is the indoor, increasingly urban-built environment. And what we're talking about is creating good habitat for people. So, uh, and, 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 and so in a lot of ways, you could say many of our environmental and social problems in many ways are a crisis of the, of the built environment, both the degradation of nature and the separation, and alienation from nature. And it's interesting that most of our modern buildings minimize contact with daylight, natural materials, natural ventilation, vegetation, views, shapes, and forms inspired by nature. And in a lot of ways, they look like the environments that non-human animals once routinely encountered in the barren cages of the old-fashioned old zoo that we've now ironically banned as inhumane. So it's inhumane to have an animal in a barren environment, but it's perfectly fine to put an office worker in, in, in a... Uh, so, and it does say a lot about how we don't really think we're an animal. We don't really think we're biological, that we can treat ourselves like a machine. Um, I don't think these are inevitable failures of modern life. I think that they're design flaws and we've, that we've deliberately uh, chosen and, um, and that we designed ourselves into this situation and we can design ourselves out of it uh, by affecting a new paradigm of design of the built environment, which is where I'd like to end up. Um, and we have. There's been some incredible advances. Actually, Chicago is very important in this advance of the U.S. Green Building Council and the LEED system. But it's largely what I would call low environmental impact design. That is, how do we minimize and mitigate our harmful effects on the environment? Uh, it's not about the reverse of that. How do we bring how the environment affects us in a way that enhances our well-being into the built environment? And so consequently, I think what we've done to date is necessary, even though it's very difficult uh, to achieve, but insufficient for true and lasting sustainability. And, and that is, uh, requires reconnecting with nature. And why is that so? Well, it, a lot of these low impact uh, uh, designs uh, typically fail to enhance our health and productivity based on our beneficial experience of nature. And, they're, and it's reflected in the fact that many of them are experientially and aesthetically impoverished with little re relation to nature, culture, and place. And, and why they're not sustainable why this is not sufficient for sustainability in the long term is that if people don't have a sense of emotional connection to the places in which they inhabit, they will not be good stewards of that places. They will not be motivated to take the actions necessary to maintain and restore those structures and places over time. And if they abandon them as the technology becomes obsolete uh, for another building, another place, um, that's not very sustainable. And, uh, and I would argue that biophilia has been our, the missing link in, in most sustainable design. So biophilia expressed in the built environment is biophilic design. What is it? Well, it's, it's something that's like a, much of biophilia has been with us, you know, a, as, a, as a species for all the time that we've been here. And you see it in many of our most revered buildings. This is a quote from Judith Herwagen that contain the essence of natural objects without being exact copies, drawing on design principles of natural forms. And you can see this in some of our greatest, uh, most revered structures. And, you know, and But some of our you know, very plain structures, and you know it very often when you experience it. This is another Ulrich study. This is uh, the same uh, emergency waiting room, the same fairly depauperate designed waiting room, windowless, but one had white walls, very sparse furnishing, very little, uh, if any, um, uh, experience of nature in either a symbolic or representational or direct way. Um, and there was a lot of problems. There was uh, stress and hostility. 
um, aggressiveness, and they redesigned it, for not very expensive, with some representations of a, a savanna-type landscape, uh, natural materials, some vegetation, and, uh, and found very significant uh, improvements in comfort and lower stress levels. Biophilic design is, are basically buildings and landscapes that are designed to enhance our well-being by fostering this positive connection to nature in, in, in a, embedded in a place that has cultural and ecological significance. And, um, you know, the great designers have always known it. You could, you could see it in those cathedrals or the Taj Mahal or, or even uh, in the ways in which we often design our, we personally design our houses and spaces. Um, but we do things on a large scale basis and very rapidly. Um, and so we, we can't rely on intuition. We need uh, specificity and guidance and, and uh, delineation of how we might accomplish um, things like biophilic design, not to create another checklist, but to provide some pathways. Um, and so this is a very preliminary system, but we've identified different elements of biophilic design uh, drawing on these different uh, dimensions, which I won't, um, I won't define in the interest of time, but just give you a sense of it. And you can see more of it in pictures, you know, environmental features, water or, or the greening of a facade, natural shapes and forms, not necessarily anything you would find in nature. Uh, and when you try to copy nature in a design form, it's often not very uh, satisfying, but it draws inspiration from design forms and creates an organic authenticity, whether it be uh, uh, the window designed by Kent Bloomer at, at Ray Ronald Reagan Airport or the Sydney Opera House. Uh, even more abstract are natural patterns and processes, the patina of age, um, fractal geometry, um, uh, balance and symmetry, uh, which all had evolutionary uh, benefits in our uh, um, as we uh, developed as a species. The use of light and space. Natural light is great, but you can go so much beyond uh, the, the, that to the use of light in, in sculptural and, and, and uh, uh, fashion in different ways. Um, and same thing with spatial uh, characteristics. Uh, Place-based connections. And then he evolved relationships to nature, such as prospect and refuge, or some of the uh, value dimensions that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm not going to burden you with this, this is an awful slide, but it's just to say that we've tried to take these elements and then break them down into specific attributes to give more um, specificity, and specificity and guidance to designers who may want to pursue this. And the danger of doing this is, first of all, it's a very crude system, but, but even if it was perfect, the danger in doing it is, you know, check off six of them and you've got it. Well, of course, Great design is not that, it's a layering and integration of these factors such that um, what results is not just simply additive, it's emergent and, and, um, and, and coherent and connected. Um, and the same thing with all these other, um, these other elements. So uh, I'm just gonna end up here and, you know, the challenge is obviously one of connection and relationship and harm in, in, in an ideal world, harmonization of, um, of ourselves uh, and the world beyond ourselves, of which we're a part, and um, and affirming that relationship with that world um, of which we're a part that's beyond ourselves, and in understanding and appreciating and respecting that world, elevating and enriching who we are as a consequence. Um, um, Ian McCarg, who wrote the great seminal book, Design for Nature, I'll put it this way, he said, clearly the problem of humans and nature, he actually said humans and man, but uh, I mean man and nature, but I changed a little bit, uh, is not one of providing a decorative background for the human play. It's not decoration. It's much more uh, fundamental and integrated than that, or ameliorating the grimness of the city. It's a necessity of sustaining nature as a source of our life, as a milieu, a teacher, a sanctum, a place of challenge, and growth as a consequence of rediscovering um, the unknown, the mysterious in ourself, and giving uh, the world meaning, uh, uh, and thereby in the process taking us from an insignificant speck of matter at a moment in time 
to something that is um, connected to uh, the world beyond ourselves in a meaningful fashion. Um, Henry Best, and I'll end up with this quote because this is where I got my uh, inspiration for the term birthright for my book and the notion that it's a birthright to be earned. He, he remarked that nature is a part of our humanity and without some awareness and experience of that divine mystery, man ceases to be man. When the Pleiades, a constellation, the wind, the grass, this is metaphorical, are no longer a part of our spirit, a part of our flesh and bone, we become something out of whack, maybe dangerous, a cosmic outlaw, having neither the completeness and integrity of our biology as an animal or the birthright of a true humanity. Um, I think that's, oh, the advertisement part. So if you'd like more information, um, I think birthright, uh, people, nation, the modern world is a, a deeper, more detailed dive into this uh, a world of trying to understand these biophilic tendencies. I try to bring it to life through a lot of storytelling, what I call interludes that are throughout the book that hopefully make it more accessible. And, uh, and then a couple of other books that might be of interest, uh, The Biophilic Design, which is a book that you know, talks more about with many different voices, many different people, um, uh, many of whom that you've heard about today uh, writing in that book. And then a book called the Biophilia Hypothesis uh, that we edited uh, back in 93 when the, the concept was first emerging. So, and then one final <laughs> advertisement. We have a, 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 a video which I, you know, the problem with the Biophilic Design book and a previous, and a book that preceded that called Building for Life um, is that uh, this is an immensely visual subject um, and it uh, becomes more meaningful when you can actually see it. Um, and, uh, but, and, uh, and so we did a, a video called Biophilic Design, the Architecture of Life, um, which is available through this outfit called uh, Bullfrog Films. And, um, and I, think, uh, I think it's a film that um, uh, many of you would enjoy. Um, we're so anyway, that's it, and I, um, I think, uh, I don't know what's on the agenda now. <laughs>